Larry Aguasano reporting from Smart Aviator Magazine. I'm here at uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut with uh, Alexander Wolf. Hello. This is a uh, first, almost a second generation Cirrus SR-22. And uh, what's unique about this airplane is it's got a uh, pretty effective um, mod. It's called the Forced Aeromotive Supercharger Mod. Uh, unfortunately, it's become a orphan mod and I'll let you tell the rest of the story. All right, so in 2008, uh, Forced Aeromotive came out with the supercharger for the Cirrus SR-22. And this was also done in parallel with uh, Tornado Alley's effort to capture the Cirrus market and to create an effective uh, way to either boost or normalize uh, you know, an aircraft engine. So what Forced Aeromotive's uh, approach was to use a pulley drive off the backside of the accessory which is this guy right here, to drive a centrifugal uh, compressor immediately uh, adjacent to the uh, blower. And that started off given a critical altitude of about 7,000 feet and it grew with revisions to the uh, blower um, as they switched over to an internal oil supply from a engine oil supply to about 9,000 feet. So it was a very nice feature for aircraft that were out in the front range of Colorado and just the Intermountain West to have access to the teen altitudes. Um, and uh, it was a pretty uh, novel design. One of the features that was particularly interesting was the turbine discharge from the blower got regulated by a what was called the boost control valve company named uh, uh, company named Megat, which is a you know DoD, and they designed this guy to normalize the discharge pressure to 29 inches for all operations, and it would basically take the manifold pressure sense data and move a uh, throttle body within this little valve itself about. 10 or 12 times uh, per second, depending on what the, uh, what the operation was. And as an emergency backup, you know, you had your normal, you know, blow off valve, which you've seen on any turbo application. Um, your upper deck reference came in right over here to pressurize uh, the, uh, the uh, fuel injection uh, system. And you'd have your 90 degree elbow going into the throttle body, just like on any other IL 550 or 520. So fast forward a couple of years and uh, the owner is getting up in age. And one thing you may not know about the owner was he was a paraplegic who lived a very long time. He was well into his seventies. Um, the question then became of, okay, what if something happens? Well, things happen, people get old. The owner died back in October last year. And what that has done is it has left every single aircraft that they have touched uh, orphaned and without support. There's a total of about 300 aircraft between Cirrus, Diamond, and Cessna, which currently have no support. And uh, that's a problem because obviously we've got a $50,000 plus system just on this installation. And, you know, many tens of thousands of dollars in maintenance over the years and in some cases decades in, in this aircraft's uh, uh, particular case. And uh, without parts, we have no options to keep this system in service and we basically lose the capability that we had and we have to go back to normally aspirated. So things that we have to deal with, we have these little parts. This is a tunnel which goes from the airbox into the supercharger itself. This was an original design which started shedding parts and going through the uh, started going through the uh, intake of the supercharger. They later changed that over to another part which was silicone rubber which had issues of itself. As you can see it cracks and occasionally throws parts into the uh, blower. Most critical part is we have this uh, drive assembly. Okay so this drive assembly sits on the back of the uh, accessory pad, the magneto drive in particular, 
and you get your rotational energy from the engine transferred over to here, which has a belt that goes on along with it. And this belt spins and turns your turbine on the blower to give you the, uh, the boosted uh, air. This guy has a nut on it and needs to be uh, torqued every 50 hours. A lot of people do it wrong. And uh, there's a frangible link inside the drive, which gets weakened every time you do that. The frangible link breaks and this gets isolated from the blower and uh, you're back to a normally aspirated condition, albeit in a much uh, degraded mode because of all the losses associated with trying to suck air through lots of equipment in between yourself and the throttle body. So when these drives go, there's a couple different failure modes. The most common one is usually a bearing failure. Those bearings are Timken bearings of some spec. And if they start to develop a, uh, what do you call it, a out of round condition that affects the shaft that's inside with a frangible link and eventually that link breaks. We're not allowed to service these. We don't have any approved data on what's inside, what type of bearings they use, what the shaft is made of, how the shaft is prepared, since it's a frangible link. Um, obviously, that's a problem for an ICA standpoint. Other things, we've got the supercharger itself, which is a modified procharger with different internals. Uh, we have no approved data on what is inside this unit either. There's some different shaft outputs, um, and that's about all the information we have. The boost controller, they're not going anywhere. They're DOD, not worried about that. Um, however, the wire harness, which it is attached to, does go bad at a rate of about every thousand hours. The drives that I mentioned previously go bad about every 500 hours, and that's uh, being generous. So, from a parts support standpoint, this is a problem, your AOG, if this goes bad. How else can you be AOG? Well, you also be AOG if you don't have one of these. You will also be AOG if you don't have this guy. This is an air box. Um, thing about the air boxes, they crack. They're made of T0 aluminum. That's, uh, that's not very robust. So you need multiples of these laying around for when they eventually do crack to be able to send them out to get weld repaired. So the issue that we as owners face is we have a system that we've paid a lot of money for, for a capability, and we have no ability to maintain that system. Uh, what the FAA is doing is kind of anyone's guess. Obviously they have the approved data, they can release it to the owners. Uh, the question is, will they? But you've got 300 aircraft between Diamond, Cirrus, and uh, Cessna that have these systems in various configurations. And everyone is completely hanging out to dry. They are one broken part away from being AOG and having to go back and do a configuration that they didn't pay for. Um, you know, it's not just a matter of finding somebody to uh, take over the company and start producing the stuff. It's not quite that easy, right? No, no. Someone has to buy the assets and then be able to uh, spin up production for what is currently installed in the field. Um, and uh, they need a uh, subject matter expert to actually guide them in the production because obviously the company had its own subcontractors that were on an approved list for being able to produce these parts. You can't just go down to a machine shop down the street and just say, hey, make this, because there's an auditing process that they had to follow as part of their PMA. Yeah. Yeah, so if there isn't somebody to come in and take this over the way it needs to be taken over from a regulatory standpoint, what happens? Uh, what are you faced with at this point? You know, you've got obviously got some components here that, that have broken and you're AOG. How are you gonna get this thing back in the air? Uh, simply, I have to convert it back to a normally aspirated, which is not what I paid for. And that's not what I spend tens of thousands of dollars over the years maintaining the system to pay for. 
Um, and it honestly, it feels kind of like a betrayal. Um, you know, we invested and we supported this company and uh, for it to end like this was really a slap in the face and unexpected. And I think, unfortunately, most owners of the system are completely unaware that this is going on and are not aware of how vulnerable they are to just being completely AOG and without any recourse. Yeah, and that's really the main reason why we come down here and, and do this video is because there probably are a lot of owners that don't know this exists. They just kind of leave it up to the shop to take care of their airplane. You know, you're pretty involved in your own airplane maintenance, but there are a lot of owners that just hand it over to the shop and shops probably don't even know about this. So. Yeah. Um, we'll keep tabs on it and report back, and uh, I appreciate your good, uh, good once-over of this. Cool. Good appreciate luck. It.